Thank you. I think you know who's who, but just a reminder that next to me is Ken Burns, and next to him is Artemis Zhukovsky III. So. I'm going to start off with a few questions. We will take a few from the audience afterwards as well. Um, first of all, how did you two meet? Well, um, Artemis and I have known each other for decades and decades. Uh, we went to the same college, the same small experimental college in uh, Massachusetts, in Amherst, Massachusetts, called Hampshire. It opened in 1970. I came in 71, and I think you came 10 years later in, in 81. So we're 10 years behind, but we both stayed very much involved with the college and had become good friends starting in, in the 80s and, and 90s. And, uh, and that's how I first heard the glimpses of this story from Artemis. Can I add one part? Even two. My mom and dad are right here. And uh. and the, only, the only way I could explain to my mom and dad where, why I was at Hampshire College was I said Ken Burns had gone to Hampshire College. And look, he got an Academy Award nomination when I was first there, and I said, I could become like Ken Burns. So that's how I explained it to my mom and dad. And I understand that, of course, this project originated with you. Yeah. You've been researching your family's story, and if I had a story like this, I'd be researching it all my life, too. At what point did you realize that this was a film as opposed to merely the wonderful book that you also have here somewhere, I think, that was published a week ago. Yeah. Um, well, it starts with my mother. She's an archaeologist. And as a child, I lived re really most of my summers on digs all over the Middle East and really came to love the past and, and learned from her that the past is never about the past. It's about what we make of the past, how we interpret the past what it means to us today. And so this is my first teacher. We started in sandboxes, progressed to ruins, and then I was making a mess of the place, so they had to you know, cordon me off. But the real moment where this all happened was um, an assignment I received when I was in ninth grade at the Allen Stevenson School here in 78th Street, and my roommate, my classmate, Dewey Wygott, is right here. And we were given an assignment to interview someone of moral courage. And imagine that kind of assignment. Imagine all of you doing that assignment. You know, find someone in your life that has inspired you. And I came home and I said, Mom, who should I speak to? And she said, Call, talk to your grandmother. She did some amazing things during World War II. And little did I know, <laughs> my life would change wow. after this interview. It was the only A I ever got in high school. <laughs> so I was very proud. But more, it changed me. Um, I had just been diagnosed, as you said, with spinal muscular atrophy and was feeling sorry for myself and a little bit worried about whether I'd live. And she came in to the hospital and said, we're not going to feel sorry for ourselves. We're going to go help others. We're going to give to others. And that's what her legacy was all about. <laughs> So you're the one who first had the idea for the film, and did you do any of the initial interviews or research prior to contacting Ken? Yeah, I, there are many filmmakers that have been part of this film. So yes, I was part of that initiation. Um, it was also inspired by two filmmakers from Keene State, Larry Benequist and Bill Sullivan. And they had read my grandmother's obituary in 1999. And they called me and said, we would like to do a film about Martha. And I said, great, let's go. I had no idea about filmmaking. But with my passion for um, you know, f storytelling and history, I started to learn about my grandparents. The first moment was we went into the basement of my grandmother's home after she passed and found 14 boxes. And in these boxes were the original documents of people they rescued. No one had ever seen these documents ever before. And one thing my grandmother was amazing at was collecting names of people she wanted to help. Now, we didn't always know in finding these boxes what those names meant. 
We had 400 names that we found in that moment. And we called the Holocaust Museum, and we said, we need to know, where are these people? And they said, well, good news. None of them died in the Shoah. But we don't know where they are. We'll find them. And so our search is happening to this day. I mean, we just met a family that found us by their documents. And this is the point about archaeology, is that the documents become the truth tellers. You know, the documents become our guide to understanding the story. And through those stories of finding people, through private detectives, through our own searches, through Mariella Holst right there, who is one of our guides, we located people, like the white-haired lovely lady, lived only five blocks from Martha. They walked by each other for 50 years. Without realizing. They never knew each other. So that's how we put it together. And then after shooting about seven or eight years, my editor here, Stephen Weckler, would you raise your hand, Mr. Weckler? Yes. Uh, we put together as much as we could and did our best job. And each time I would see Ken at a reunion, I said, would you look at my film? And poor Ken receives about 100 requests a week he has a full-time person who just says, no, thank you. <laughs> no, I love you. You're great, but I can't do this. And uh, something touched his heart, and here we are. Wow. Well, it, it, makes, <laughs> it makes total sense listening to you describe the process that Ken Burns would be the one to come in, because the whole notion of learning about history or archaeology through intimate detail, mm -hmm. through hearing a personal story in his or her own words. I mean, what this documentary has, which so many great films do, is a corroboration mm -hmm. between an individual voice and the uniqueness of a memory, and then archival footage or the documents that actually make you realize you can trust what this person is remembering because it matches up to this other person and this other person, and then suddenly you have a totality, a coherence. And not every work of either fiction or nonfiction has that coherence. So Ken, you, you didn't immediately say no. When you came in, though, obviously there, there had to be some division of labor. I am curious, you know, who did what in terms of, I mean, I don't think of this as a Ken Burns film for reasons that I'll go into in a moment, but maybe you could talk about how you shaped whatever it was that Artemis yeah, had. It, it, it is definitely not a Ken Burns film. It's an Artemis Joukowsky film, and it's also a Matthew Justice film who's here, the co-producer. And when uh, there were several informal conversations and telephone calls that I had with Artemis about the project in which it was a friend sort of saying, yep, go that way, that sounds good, that, but there was no interest in my part, and in fact, I don't even know if I had fully, I know I hadn't fully sort of drunk in the story. I mean, I, when I was working on my first film, I said that I was uninterested in um, the dry dates and facts and events, but I was interested in an emotional archeology, span and it's so interesting that I found this irresistible, man and he became a friend and what happened is he sent uh, a rough cut, I guess you would call it, right. or an assembly or something that had been put together and it, I just, I fell in love with all of the things that were in it, the potentiality of the film, but also the potentiality of the lives that were saved versus all of those who could not be saved about the sacrifice and what the cost of sacrifice is in a very complicated and nuanced story. And it was all the principal photography was done. I would say 95% of the archival uh, accumulation had been done. I had uh, suggestions of what to go to for generic World War II things. But what I did do is get interested in telling the story in a really ordered and structured way. And so, I mean, first, I, I thought that we could get a better narrator of a voice of Waitstill Sharp and <laughs> was able to uh, impose upon my friend Tom Hanks to do it. And <laughs> he's Actually, I have to in, bring in a tiny detail here. I just moderated a panel at the Telluride Film Festival in the mountains of Colorado where I'm fortunate enough to see Ken Burns every year. Tom Hanks was on the panel. It was about how films of 2016 are redefining the image of the American hero. 
And of course, he was talking primarily about Sully, the film that opened last week, where he plays a quintessentially, shall we say, New York hero. And at one point, I said, and by the way, you have another film talking about heroism. September 20th, PBS is going to be showing Defying the Nazis, the Sharps War, where you incarnate this hero. And he goes, I had to hound Ken Burns for years. <laughs> to I wanted to be part of the Ken Burns family of voices, and it took me a while, but I got in there. <laughs> yeah, but I know he already was a voice in, in well, the war, in, right? in several films, and it, there's a real kernel of truth in it, is that I was at a party in Los Angeles, and I was with my two grown daughters, who were then teenagers, and Tom Hanks, this was like 2001, 2002, was across the room talking with some people, and I was working up my courage to go and ask him if he would possibly consider being a voice. And he broke, and my girls were saying, just go interrupt, just introduce him. I'm saying, no, 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 he's talking. And it'll be going, Dad, go just say hello. And suddenly he saw me and he broke away, and he said, Burns, I owe you big time. Hmm. He said, when we were doing um, From the Earth to the Moon, uh, when we were having trouble with our episodic dramatic structures, we would study your films. Is there anything I can do for you? <laughs> and that's been, that was like 15 years ago and, and he's read in a number, and he's unbelievable. If this film had been made at the time the Sharps were doing their miraculous work, Jimmy Stewart would have to play them. <laughs> and he's no longer with us and we're fortunate to have someone who embodies a kind of quintessential American hero as, as, as Tom did. So, I, I got Tom to read the voice of Wait Still, and then I did things. I moved the letter that's at the end, a portion of it to the beginning. February 46, yes. I was wondering. And, and, and what, what I wanted to do was invest this with the interpersonal stuff from the very beginning, that this is about loss, about longing, about a couple, about a relationship. There's very little of the letter. It's only at the end of the film that you fully understand the, in some ways, tragic dimensions of, of that letter. But it also sets up a different kind of counterpoint to the larger thing. The larger thing being the Holocaust, this being a tiny little story sort of knocking on a side door of that, where there's just a few hundred people saved, just, and a couple dozen witnesses to that, corroborators, you would say. And, and then it was how to structure it. And uh, there was um, a lot of work to be done, I felt, but it was very, very clear that it, it was resonant in so much as we have a, a refugee crisis. And I have to say that one never works on a film in, about the past with any intention of connecting the dots to the present. Mm -hmm. If you do your job well, the dots will be connected right. a priori. So it was, there was never a day when you said, oh, isn't this very much like Syria or like Iraq or, or something like that? We just knew that if we could do our job uh, and focus entirely on, on restructuring it. So truth be told, three years ago I saw this and kind of fell in love with the project and fell in love with Artemis and, and sort of moved from being a kind of ad hoc advisor to being a, 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 a sort of an, an acknowledged advisor to being an executive producer, raising money to being a co-producer. Matthew sort of very kindly sort of made room. And then Artemis's design from the very beginning was for me to take over and, and direct it. And then ended up as a, as a co-director of the film. And because this was an orphan, and, and I mean that in the best and most charitable way. I was working on six or seven other films, and I had to attend to this film whenever I had a moment. After I put my little girls to bed, uh, on the weekends, uh, at the end of a long day of editing, we'd then go back in and uh, screen uh, this, and Artemis and Matthew would make these pilgrimages up from Massachusetts to New Hampshire, where I live and work, and we just, I would give notes, and a week later I'd give more notes, or two weeks later I'd give more notes, and it was really just this kind of fine-tuned centering, and you know, got fully engaged in it. But it is very much Artemis's film. Well, one, and I'll start with Artemis about this, one thing that distinguishes this film from most of your work, or two things really, is that when I think Ken Burns' film, it's period music. It's, it's the only music I really hear in one of your films is the music that okay. would have emanated from that period. Mm -hmm. And so in here we have a score yeah. by Sheldon Merowitz. So maybe we could talk a little about the kinds of discussions you might have had. And I don't think I have ever seen in one of your films, Ken, a reenactment. Yeah. In other words, where you stage a scene with actors to represent 
something that we we it, we've done it uh, just in very very modest ways. I I, I don't like it, and uh, I sort of feel like if you're going to do that, you might as well make a feature film. In our Lewis and Clark, a two-part four-hour film, we felt because we were trying to see subjectively the country that they saw then, we had to understand who they were. It wasn't just two guys and a dog and an Indian teenager. <laughs> it was, in fact, the core of discovery, you know, two or three dozen men. And so we found at various junctures along the way people who reenacted. And we said, can you just come and at dawn and not drink until we're done shooting? And, <laughs> and, and we're going to film you in silhouette and at distance in much the same way. So when I came in this, and it's very important that you recognize that this is not a Ken Burns film in that way is that there were several things I had to honor. Obviously, the gist of the story, but also the reenactments, which I wouldn't have done, but I think were helped make this the kind of Alan first novel, but a documentary come alive. There's also the different editor, Eric Angra, who, who did most of the editing, has an incredibly different style from mine. It's very fast paced and very ADD at times, and my job was to slow that down. Mm -hmm and to, to permit it, but also to say, to acknowledge that this work had been done and to let it go in this place and that place where I felt it worked and then figure out where the respiration, editing is about, is like music but also like breathing. So you, you have to f you, you, you do that. So at the very end I was moving two frames or four frames and opening up and closing down and it was just three years of, of centering but had to honor the part of this that is their film and is very much their film, and I, w I wanted only to make it better. It wasn't something that was sui generis. It was something that I was trying to be generous with. <laughs> Sorry. That's a wonderful play on words. <laughs> um, and, and Artemis, you felt, though, that something like the reenactments were important to the kind of story that you wanted to tell. If you could talk about that, and also, this is a very compact film. You know, we're talking about 80 minutes, which in the Ken Burns canon is, you know, an introduction. <laughs> yes. So, you know, were you at times, um, Artemis, thinking that this might be more of a miniseries, in fact? Because as, as I'm sure all of you are aware, there's quite an ellipsis towards the end of the film between December 1941 and the end of the war. I mean, it's just, it, 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 it's a jump. Little did you know that this is the beginning of an 18-part series. <laughs> and you're just seeing the first one because that's what we've uh, presented. And we're going to be working the next 18 years. <laughs> I'm kidding. You know, one thing I have learned from Ken, and I did not start this project being a filmmaker, but I'm proudly a co-director with Ken, is that all editing, every filmmaking, happens in the editing room. And what does that mean? What that means is you can shoot all the interviews, you can shoot all the images, but the story is told in those, those frames. And by the way, they're 30 frames per second. So when he says, open up two frames, Matthew and I would look at each other and say, OK. <laughs> you know, and we're m m melding the music, and we're melding the scene. But largely, what Ken did so beautifully was make this a love story. It was a Mission Impossible, you know, dart through Alan, you know, the, 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 the Alan First type novel. And what Ken did was say, no, this is a love story. Let's make this about their love. And that is what propelled them to do this work was their love. Not just love for each other. You know, most people have a love for their family or friends. Martha and Waisel had a love for humanity, for people far away. And that's what we wanted to show. And what Ken also did was make sure whenever we talked about a subject, a person, we always contextualized that in history. So that person is introduced like Rosemary Feigl, and we see the planes coming over. So we're always bringing the story into that context where the history comes alive. And that's the genius of Ken Burns. And so even before Ken got involved in those three years of editing, he was my mentor. He was the one, that was the standard. And every reunion, I would see him with a new cut. He would say, well, better, but do this and make more context and open it up here and really slow it down there. And I said, OK. And I would do it. And he respected my persistence. And then when Matthew got involved, we had a film team, because Matthew had had that experience as an HBO director, a person with tremendous background. 
And so suddenly I had two mentors. My, 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 my mentor of Hampshire College and this ex extreme example of success, but also of, of, of intimacy in and that, in that work he does. And Matthew, who was really the film teacher. It was almost like going to film school full time. And so we had this wonderful repartee of the three of us working together. Now, I have a question precisely because you've just zeroed in on what I think is a wonderful frame for this film, the love story. And a, a detail like her letter where she's lonely and says, I'm reading Lady, Lady Chatterley's <laughs> Lover. I need to you talk to you about it. this. You know. I, I, I was so touched by that. And then when you suddenly learned that they divorced, my heart sank. Yes. Because I thought, no, no, a couple no. like that who's been through what yes. they have together, right. how could they? So, I mean, um, were you surprised to learn that? Who, who, did he re, who did he marry in 57? Who did she marry in 57? I mean, I, this is like, I, I just wanted, I'm curious. You know, can I, before, before he answers that, I, I agree completely. I, I felt that one of the things that was hidden, there was something, I, I don't want to say embarrassed, but the film itself didn't accurately give that wonderful moment of when says Lady Chatter. I've been, by the way, I've been reading Lady Chatterley's Lover, and I have some things to talk to you about. <laughs> and, I mean, to me, that is the best kind of, uh-oh, we already know where she's from. We already know this character who's been, you know, thrown out of her own home for daring to go to college. It's a social worker who's committed, and she finds herself in this middle-class uh, marriage and a middle-class circumstance where the most dramatic thing is what you're gonna say on Sunday, your husband. And, and, and this opportunity comes, they go for the first time, and you know, it's just amazing that you leave your kids, goodbye, and then you're dodging Gestapo agents a month later, and your husband is laundering money in the capitals of Europe, and then you come home and you think this is now it, and they get forced back, they kind of get embarrassed back, they're announced that they're going back, and then they're back, and, and my feeling is, is that they're both extraordinarily brave, they do the things they do, Wade still comes home, and this he now wants to go back to the fire. And something in the second trip awakens in her this desire. She is a different person who comes back from that second trip. And she is no longer of that unit, but of another unit. You would say the world of humanity. Mm -hmm. And that's the story I was interested in. And, and it's very interesting. Some people have reacted, friends who looked at it said, well, it's kind of weird that they, you know, they didn't stay together. And it was an embarrassment of being unable to deal with it. Some of them are that emotional sense of the loss. I feel all of those range of things and wanted them to exist in the film. And we, we tried to highlight that as we, as we structured it. So it, it does come, you know, things change and, and stuff is altered. And, uh, I, I love that. It's, not, it, it's, it's Oscar Schindler, too, you know? He's, he's a, a very complicated character, not the best example of a human being, and at the very end, he feels like he hasn't done enough, just like Wade Still, just like Martha, you know, beset by the sense that they had only saved a few. And also, I mean, psychologically, for Schindler, for the Sharps, and for many people, actually people even that I knew, because my, my, my father was rescued, well, was, he was protected during World War II and hidden by Polish peasants. There is sometimes, after such intense activity where you're forced into heroism by daily detail, that suddenly when life becomes normal again, you're lost, you're, because you no longer have the external imperatives towards courage and, and great action that defined you for a few years during the war, and suddenly, like, life is, uh. I agree, this is, this is PTSD, a version of it, yeah. which is the experience of that kind of danger is so vivifying that you live life at a kind of heightened edge, the way a soldier does, that it is very hard to come back and unpack that. And I think for Martha, it was the sort of second stage of the rocket of her life, and it propelled her into her life. For Waits Till, it was more reflective. We've done this, let's go back, let's make the family again. And, and she's, you know, how can you keep them down on the farm once you've seen Paris? It was really <laughs> that she had found her life's work, and, and they were, 
and it's sad, but kind of just at the same time absolutely true. But I didn't want to. No, I want to actually build on that idea, if you don't mind. You know, we chose to make the divorce part of the film, not the central part of the film, but largely because this notion of humanizing the story. If you had just seen the first 20 minutes, you see a heroic story of two people, and you would look at it like Superman, like these are people made out of comic books, and we don't understand them. But real, real heroes are everyday people. Real heroes are everyone in this room. And we can choose that. And one thing we've learned from this film is that altruism is actually a choice of identity. And that this is part of this choice they both made in different ways, not at one moment like a new age workshop, like, okay, we're gonna go do this. It was, it was like Hercules picking up the, the, the oxen. He, he picked a small calf, it grew and grew, and he, they learned how to help people. So the divorce becomes important because we want to show them as full human beings. And I was actually editing that part of the film when I was getting a divorce. So for me, this was a way for Waisel and Martha to kind of mentor me that it would be okay, in a sense, and that a lot of people get divorced, you know? So it wasn't that we thought their lives were so important you should know that they were divorced. It was more that we wanted to show their full lives as human beings. Sure. It was organic, you know, to the process. And also, I mean, it's fascinating to me that Martha comes back, she runs for Congress, and then she devotes herself, I mean, to a variety of causes, but especially Jewish children. I mean, relocating Jewish children, Palestine, for yeah. example. I have to ask a very silly question, but we are at the 92nd Street Y. So Artemis, in many of the photos, Martha, she really kind of looks Jewish to me. And I was, <laughs> forgive me, but I was wondering, might there have been a little bit of Jewish ancestry in well, Martha? Because what led her to become so engaged with Jewish children? Well, Unitarians um, believe in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so I think every Unitarian feels they're a little bit Jewish. <laughs> in the real sense. And you think about Reform Judaism and Unitarianism. You know, Jesus is a great, a great teacher, a mentor, a... A, a, a divine, let's say, teacher of spirit, but not the divine son of God. And I think they did feel that connection to Jews. Uh, they had never known Jews in their lives, either of them, really, in their growing up years in Providence. But this exposed them to this horrific moment. And as that beautiful quote where Martha talks about the dignity of these refugees and, and the way that they had a sense of um, uh, connection to, to what Waisel and Martha were trying to do. And, 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 and so that was something we wanted to show in that, in that part of the conversation. Now I understand. So you were not surprised at the alliance of the Unitarian Church and the Quaker underground right. to save Jewish refugees. I mean. I, I think there's a kind of logic to it and just extending that sense of um, there's not a lot of the distracting heaven and hell. It's just what you do on this life, what you can do. The Unitarians are focused in that way, and I think she recognized in Judaism a similar sort of almost existential uh, existence that was required, and they're making, both of them, you know, supreme existential acts that then, you know, echo back to us and ask us some pretty uh, tough questions, you know. I think just the existence of knowing their story uh, forces us into an uncomfortable kind of relationship with ourselves. What would we do? What would we do now? What are you doing? Why haven't you done? You know, these are uh, interesting. Oh, sure. I mean, look, I, I think it's impossible for any viewer today to watch this film and hear, I believe it's Heinz saying, no country was prepared to take the Jewish, re the refugees from Europe. You have to hear a resonance in yeah. terms of our own present day of charged policies and of behavior towards especially Syrian refugees. And, and one of the most amazing things about Martha, imagine Martha coming back from Europe, she goes to the governor of Alaska and says, you know, you need people. We have about six million. <laughs> we can have great hospitals and great universities. 
Um, actually, she proposed that 10,000 Jews go to Alaska, very specifically, worked on that behalf. It, eventually, the anti-Semitic attitude of the State Department said no. But imagine if 10,000 Jews got to Alaska. I mean, Eric Palin wouldn't have been governor. I can't <laughs> <say that. laughs> you can see Russia. I can see Russia. <laughs> Okay, to come back to this film, I apologize for my um, digression. Um, uh, the point is made that in June 2006, Yad Vashem recognized the, the Sharps. And that, if I understand correctly, five Americans, only five out of the approximately 25,000 right. that Yad Vashem has recognized. I was really curious who are the other three? Mm. And you know, just what, what meaning it has. Yeah. That the, the Sharps are there. Well, the first was Varian Fry, um, who we mentioned in the film. And Varian Fry is a very curious figure uh, in the sense that he was really a loner. Um, he was not, he was very cerebral. He took on this mission as a duty. But then, like the Sharps, when he got there, his heart opened up to these people and um, was very heroic. I think saved two or 3,000. Um, great intellectuals. The Sharps, as we show, were part of that initiation. So one of the things I want, we wanted to do with this film is show that the Sharps didn't work in isolation. They worked with all these partners, Hiram Bingham, Varian Fry, um, um, this incredible American from Butte, Montana, who gets angry at the Nazis, leaves Montana, goes to France, um, and starts bringing people over the mountains. We never know anything about him. Um, but there are these amazing stories, and we think uh, that there are more Americans. And this is one of the exciting kind of results of this project that we're now looking at, is this larger American involvement, starting with Eleanor Roosevelt. She plays this incredibly important role, um, and, and Ken knows her story and told it so beautifully. For me, she is one of the great examples that Martha had. This is who Martha looked up to. And now we know that Eleanor directly was involved. And that was something that our research team took about seven years to verify in her papers. And it was actually Ken's film on the Roosevelt's where we had an archivist who found that document that we show in the film where Eleanor is instructing the State Department to get Leon Forchfanger out. And that was the smoking gun. When we found that document, we had the evidence. Wow. So, there's a lot of stories, and, and we've been just completely s sort of, it's impossible to be separate from this project, but I've been talking to the Holocaust Museum ourselves about doing a film on the United States and the Holocaust because of the Roosevelt's and indeed our earlier film on World War II and a couple people want to know right. why this happened, why the St. Louis was turned away, why the tracks to the uh, camps weren't bombed. These are hugely important questions. and. I'm shamed by the five. I am inspirited by the idea that yeah. we can uncover others who might qualify, but it seems out of 25,000 righteous among the nations that there would be only five of them were yeah. Americans. Is um, I mean, we our own self PR, our own sense of exceptionalism forgets to understand as much as we grow the kind of heroes that Waitzel and Martha make. We also, as we know. This election cycle grow, you know, aberrant versions right. of ourselves, in, and and some of the worst characteristics are allowed to sort of metastasize uh, in this country, and and it's important that we tell that story too, and be shocked and yeah. saddened by. You know, Wastel Sharp declared war from the pulpit. Imagine, I mean, for the, could I see a show of hands for Unitarians in the room? <laughs> How many Unitarians have ever heard a minister declare war on another country? <laughs> I mean, can you imagine that moment? And my mom was there, you know, like, what is wrong with this man that he would declare war? But that's the way he felt. And the isolationism of America coming out of the Depression, but also combined with the anti-Semitism of Father Coughlin and this kind of, ex you know, blaming the entire Depression on the Jews was, of course, false. But more importantly, it justified Americans' isolationism. Right. Now, it, it's true that this film 
sheds light upon and is related to other films that have been made. I mean, Ruth Gruber is a name that comes to mind. There have been other films made about Varian mm -hmm. Pride, both documentary and the fiction film that starred William Hurt, which yeah. was made right. for, for television. But what's, I think, very touching for many of us is when we learn about somebody we never heard of mm -hmm. and find out that the ripple effect, you know, you toss the pebble in, the reverberations of how many people were saved thanks to the efforts of Wait Still Sharp. One of my favorite moments in the film, because you're talking about how they didn't work alone, when I think it's Martha's voice describes the line at four o'clock in the morning at the hotel yeah. where everyone was coming to burn right. their documents once they realized that they were in danger. I could suddenly picture you know, this hotel with everybody lined up with papers to burn th that version of a shredder that we would you know, have today. Right. Um, and it, it's that sense of, wouldn't it be great if we knew about other people with whom they worked? Do you believe that now you do have access to finding that through this film? I, I think so. Perhaps. And, and I, the relationship that's been longstanding between Artemis and the, this project and the Holocaust Museum, yes. I mean, the problem is, is that, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. It's a completely unknown story and you're just sort of diving into that you don't know anything of it and it, and it helps in the newness to, to give a new perspective on things that seem familiar but also are hard to sort of comprehend and I, I like that part of it. But the idea of learning more, not everything went up in those furnaces we get, we're getting contacted by people all the time is gonna be very exciting to see what happens, particularly once it's broadcast on TV. Of course. And forgive me, I have to ask this question, maybe some of you are thinking of the same question. First for Artemis, have you been tempted to make a fiction feature, maybe starring Tom Hanks as we still, <laughs> maybe someone great. younger? I don't know. But in other words, the story itself is powerful, yeah. yes. and one can imagine that even though a documentary like yours will reach its core audience, how many more millions of people around the world are reached by a fiction version than a documentary? Has this ever been talked about? We've, we've, we thought about it. I have a feeling that after September 20th, uh, which is next week, uh, we all get phone calls, and there'll be some interest. Uh, it happens in every time we make a film, because people get excited by the fact that, that true stories are really good stories, because they are true. And the complication of this, the love story of this, and, and the breakup of it, I think, is irresistible, particularly set against the, the backdrop of it. But I want to say that, for me, this film is enough. Yeah. You know, too. because you don't want to exaggerate anything. You want to stay with their words. You want to stay with their photographs. You want to feel them. And yes, it could become that, but I actually think more importantly than even a bigger film is the understanding of the depth of this story and going further in. For example, you know, all the interviews we did, we now can make short films of all these families. You know, we can now look at the Bronfelds. Where were they from? Who were they were? You know, and, and to really dive into some of these intimate stories of, of Americanism, you know, coming to America. So, uh, although I don't have plans to do that, we're still in the moment of, of this. What will come out of this, I don't know. I know that, for me, the real passion is sh connecting this story to the refugee <laughs> crisis today and showing the, you know, the human face of refugees right. and having people connect to that feeling of fear of where am I going to sleep, you know, where am I going to eat, and then feeding people and then finding them getting killed because you're feeding them. I mean, that's also a moment that well, is so intense for Waistel to realize he's yeah. feeding these people, and then because he is feeding them, they get injured because they're suspected. So, you know, these not, not linear decisions that you're making in this moment, and we wanted to show the complexity and the and actually the contradictions of some of these human complications. Sure, and that does come through, but it also m makes me feel that there's a, a good reason why Yad Vashem would have only five Americans versus out of 25,000, because obviously the war was fought primarily on European soil. Right. And even though Waitstill and Martha and others took great risks, especially going there to actively rescue people, in Poland, any 
Christian peasant who hid a Jew, the penalty was death and death of the whole family of that person. Yeah. So it's not surprising to me that the highest proportion of nationalities represented in Yad Vashem is Poland, where despite the existence of anti-Semitism then and potentially afterwards, um, there were many people who daily risked their lives. That was true in most countries in Europe. And Americans were not tested in the same way. We were not given the same opportunities to be tested, thank goodness. Um, and therefore, it's, 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 it, there couldn't be a very high number of Americans there. But, but this is a really wonderful point to, to drive home the courage of the Sharps, because they not only left my mom and my uncle in Wellesley, imagine that, to go to this faraway place. Most of the people on Yad Vashem's list were people living in the community where they were helping their neighbors. And they had the human desire to connect. This was extraordinary, like Wallenberg, where he literally leaves his life to go into a world he knows nothing about, just to help. And um, I think that part of it, to me, is what is the example, yes. you know. Right and hopefully to serve as an inspiration to people today. And, and I know, I mean, one could make, I, I, I actually, I should give this as a thesis topic to one of my own students. There are these wonderful stories that we know about rescuers like Aristide de Sosa, Aristide de Sosa Mendes, mm -hmm. um, who was also in Lisbon, Su Sugihara in Japan. You could start to like create charts of the cross sections of yeah. who was saved, how, who ended up in the United States. And your ending dedication is to those who were not <coughs> rescued. And it made me wonder, what is the percentage? In, in other words, what sense do we have of, whether it was the weights, the sharps, or, or others, how many were rescued compared to? Well, according to Mordecai Paldil, who is our historian in the film, he estimates about 500,000 were rescued. Among the 25,000, they rescued 500,000. Um, among 25? Among the 25,000 righteous, they oh, rescued 500,000 total, um, which is a very high number. No, no, but it's actually in the old, you know, 10 years ago when we started, they thought the number was 50,000. So what's really coming out is that the, 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 the survival, for example, on our list, when we found the 400 names, none of them had died. So these were 400 names that no one knew what had happened. And I think that is a reflection of World War II. World War II, we romanticize World War II. We make it into this wonderfully heroic American story, the Good War. But it was also the most devastating war in history. And it killed millions of people. And the starvation and the refugee crisis after you know, is only second to what's happening today. So I think we can, we have to realize how devastating that war was, how many people lost loved ones and their communities. Well, and also, what you're raising makes me feel that this film, while not a Ken Burns film, is very much related to your seven-part series, The War, yes. yeah. from 2007, exactly. because what you were doing there, which was kind of new, was tracing in World War II, not simply in terms of what we already know and archival footage in Europe, it was the effect on American lives, exactly. located primarily in, in four cities. Um, when you started working on this film, did you feel that? Oh, I, I, I felt it totally. And in fact, I think part of what permitted me to sort of be drawn irresistibly to it was the fact that we had already participated in an American view of that war from four geographically distributed towns whose collective citizens, survivors, sort of saw a representative sample of the war and permitted us to do something that the war documentaries hadn't done, which is show the simultaneity of all the theaters. So that we tend to sort of um, corral certain parts of the world. A European theater is episodes one and two. And then you go to the Pacific. and. The soldiers themselves didn't even know what was going on. But at home, when you picked up the paper, there'd be the European theater on one side of the, and the Pacific theater on the other. So everything was happening at the same time. So when we landed at D-Day, we then went home for the reaction to the news. And then we went to Saipan in the Marianas, where the, with the beginning of the invasion of that island in the Pacific, then went back to the, the uh, 
allies being sort of stuck in the hedgerows of Normandy and unable to go back, back to the continuation of Saipan, back home, then breaking out of the hedgerows, it's as it happened. And there were people who could guide us along the way, who were writing, and you know, Tom Hanks's voice is, a, is the editor of the Rock McIntosh. County star, Al McIntosh, mm -hmm. and he's an amazing figure. I mean, if you were gonna be in a very safe place in World War II, there'd be no safer place than Laverne, Minnesota. It was gonna take the Germans a long way to get to Minnesota, and it was gonna take the Japanese an even longer way to get there from that way, and and yet he got it, and that was what we we saw we could do. You could find the world in a grain of sand, as William Blake said, and 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 this was the same story. And for me, as I've sort of hinted at, it, I spoke about it yesterday a lot, which is there is a certain opacity to the phrase six million. We don't we say it, and it now doesn't have meaning. When you meet the people who survive, the few that we get to meet in this film, and by extension, the 10 or 15 times that many people that they actually were able to save, and you see in our extended fates at the end of the film what they've become, you begin to understand the potentiality of all those were lost, which accounts for our dedication because these were lives that could have been as fully lived as the lives that were rescued. And that helped me, at least, understand that number and take, and take the mystery of it, make it a little bit less opaque. Um, we were at the Holocaust Museum in Washington last night, and they have a, a wonderful interpretive thing. Instead of saying six million, when you come in, they say in 1933, there were nine million Jews in Europe. By 1945, two out of three were dead. And we stole that line for our film, The War, and we showed at the liberation of the camps uh, three emaciated survivors, male, on a bunk and in their striped uniforms staring out in that incredible way to the camera. And we had a three shot to say nine million and then we isolated one to say two out of three were dead. And that to me was the beginning of my attempt to sort of take a figure that is so overused and try to give it real flesh and bones. And when you see that this person became a professor emerita of French or Russian or a mathematics or did this or did that, or raised a family, tended a garden, was an RAF pilot, was a poet, you, you begin to f sense that that six million is an amputated limb that is still itching and still is, is, is loss is still being felt, and not abstractly, but now concretely, even in this tiny, tiny little story, in this little sure. grain of sand. One of the, I think for me, most moving moments in the film, and this may be an editing choice, is I think it's Renee who, uh, no, it's someone else, one of the child survivors says um, that her family was killed in Auschwitz, but I don't want to dwell on that now. However, the camera stays Goethe. for an extra, Goethe, it stays for about an extra three seconds yes. on her face, forcing me anyway mm -hmm. to think for a moment about the loss. Yeah. In other words, it's that extra beat yes. that makes film so much more potent for me than photographs or any other yes. medium because it's that time element that takes me where her inner thoughts must That's be. That's exactly right, and you understand that as well as anybody. We put, after that note, a period to sustain that note. Yeah. quite consciously, and that's the respiration, that's the music of it. And some things are quick and staccato and, and you know, eighth notes and sixteenth notes and thirty-second notes, and sometimes you have whole notes that sustain and sustain and sustain, and in that is where it all happens. Between the cuts, the intervals of notes, a musician would say, and in, in those pauses. And this gives you an idea of how much fun I've had for three years. <laughs> and, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that just says it right there. Yeah. And I'm having way too much fun getting to ask all the questions. <laughs> so I have to share this. We're going to raise the lights. We have time for a few questions from the audience. And if necessary, I don't know if there is somebody with microphones. If so, great. If not, I will repeat the question. Um, feel free to raise your hand. There's a woman on the aisle. Go right ahead.
where or with whom did, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear everything. Uh, where or with whom did the sharks leave the children when they went to Europe? The question of. Oh, it wasn't. I, didn't, I don't know. It wasn't considered important, really. Well, I think it is actually a very important question. We didn't. We we felt that if we got too mired in the details of how it all worked, you'd get lost in that moment. But it is a great question, and um, you know, I think the the answer to the question, just so everyone could hear the the answer, was my mother and her, my uncle was taken care of by the congregation, and it was the first person was really my grandmother's um, aunt and uncle by adoption, the Stebbinses, who moved in and took care of you and, and Hastings. And uh, you know, that was part of the devotion for every Martha and Wastel Sharp out in the world. There's the home base. There's the work of organizing that effort. And many, many Unitarians played the, an active role in supporting and, and, and also you have to understand, this is a film without a narrator which is very, very uncommon for me, but I think entirely appropriate for the, this film, which means that you have to rely on the words principally of Waitstill and, and Martha to advance the narrative, supplemented by historians, and then of course, validated, corroborated, uh, Annette would say, by the evidence represented by these lives and the archives that accompany these lives, and so, you sometimes just have to say, that's going to be, a, it's a huge question, we talked about it all the time, it's going to have to be something that, because it wasn't explicated well, is just going to be, have to be one of those loose ends, and it's, it's, part of, it's part of filmmaking. It's in the 18th uh, period of this film, 20 years from now, that we'll explain. <laughs> well, after all, I mean, this one is defying the Nazis, the Sharps War, so obviously the frame is Right. Their activity and during the war. I too kept wondering about what it right. might have been like. So your parents are heroes. A, a child can hear. Who cares? You know, they, the, they I want my me. mommy. You know. Yeah, I want my. So, it, but that's like another, completely other yeah. frame that. And it's okay, as Ken says, to have questions. That's what allows you to build a larger narrative of the story. And uh, you know, I published a book that's come out just now about the story and it's deeper and it's more rich, it's more detailed of these kind of issues of what happened with my mom. Um, the film is a way to enliven you into this conversation. The film is an invitation to, to get to know more. And I think what, what, what Ken and Matthew and I are so proud of is that we don't, we didn't want you to get stuck in the, as, as Ken would say, the weeds. We wanted you to stay in the big picture. So, and, and can I say, I, I meant to say this earlier, that actually the film that you first brought was 50, right. 6, 58, somewhere around there. Yep. And I, I felt that it had rushed through things. So a lot of, you, you're not, no, this is not Stop the Presses, <laughs> and I was going to make it longer. <laughs> but, but it was, and I just, since the lights are up, I also want to acknowledge Marina Goldman, who, more than holds her own against uh, her Tom Hanks, her husband, and um, uh, it's very, very smart. I mean, I always thought it was a very smart thing of me to get Tom to do this, but it was as smart to leave Marina in because she is so fantastic. Think about, think about. Yeah, because we don't know what you look like no. from the film. I want to, I want to, I want to. I want to segue, if I may, between Marina. Marina is a nurse practitioner that goes to Sierra Leone and brings surgeons and helps people, and she did not want to get paid for her role. She said, I'd like the money to go to a nonprofit and for us to create what we call the Sharp Rescuer Prize. And Marina was awarded the first prize for her work in, South, in West Africa to prevent Ebola. And her village that she worked with literally prevented Ebola from spreading with just 10,000. And 
then would the Woodhouse family all stand up? This family. You don't know yet, you don't know yet what they did. They left their home in Long Island. Don't, don't get down, yeah. And they took all these beautiful children of theirs to Lesbos because Latifa is Afghani, met her husband as a Fulbright scholar 30 years ago or 10 years ago, depending on who's counting, <laughs> and went and started providing rescue work herself and themselves as a family. And so this is what we want to actually inspire, is this kind of spontaneous, and this is one of the things Ken, and, Ken talks a lot about, it's about individual courage. That's how things actually happen. And so we want to acknowledge you in this moment for what you did to help others in this inspiration. <laughs> on, the, on the 20th at the community church, Ken and I will be doing an event the day that President Obama is at the UN talking about refugees. And we are connecting our film to his refugee policy to humanize what a refugee looks like and use this film to help propel us. And the Woodhouses have provided not just that example, but the reminder that each of us, ordinary people, can do extraordinary things, like Martha and Waisel did. So. <laughs> Only if permission is given by the... What's that? I Could just want to say one word. I, we are honored and humbled by this uh, Sharp Rescue Award, but to be honest, 10 years ago when we saw this movie in a whole different form, and I thought, being a Unitarian, I said, wow, the Unitarians, Martha and Waste Sharp went and did this work, so the inspiration comes from that time. And of course, we will continue to be walking in their shoes, and we will do our humanitarian mission, but that's where we were inspired. Not only me, my husband Colin, and all my children who are here have been with us and will continue the good work. Thank you very, very much. Um, we are actually pretty much at the end of our allotted time. I, I do want to, first of all, mention that Ken Burns has a whole new series that will be on PBS in 2017 on the Vietnam War, which I cannot wait to see personally because I know that for me, he illuminates especially American history in a more profound way than any other form that I know. And um, I just want to end by expressing my profound gratitude to Artemis Zhukovsky for sharing this family story with the entire world and for, I think, reminding us that the Sharps War was not merely a temporal one against Nazis during World War II. That war is against indifference. And that transcends every nation and every era. Mm -hmm. And we are constantly in deep need of role models who can remind us that there are paths beyond selfishness, beyond contemporary noisy, political rhetoric, there are means in which human beings can make a real difference. And film artists like these two people can help us reach that. So thank you very, thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you.